All right, good morning, everybody. It's a good, exciting time to be here this morning and thankful that uh, you're here this morning. I mean, you know, you start off at church on Sunday, God will bless the rest. Amen? Amen. So it's good to be here. It's good not just to start the year that way, but it's also good to end, end strong, end the year strong. I want to share with you something this morning. Just God put something on my heart. I think it's a message that's really going to be a blessing to everyone in the room, no matter how old you are, whether you're young or old, married or single, or old and little old and getting a little older every day. I'm in that category. I feel a little bit older every year, and I don't know why, but the years go faster and faster uh, the more they come, and I love watching my kids grow up. And, you know, we have some Christmas traditions that we do, and one of them is uh, Christmas a Christmas Eve celebration, and uh, since I was young, even from an early day, early age, I can remember uh, singing songs and uh, just uh, with my family and celebrating the Lord, and this year was very special. It's even extra special because we had my mom all the way from Texas, my mom, Carmen, she's right there. And she came from Texas, so I told Pastor Dan, there are now three Texans in the room, me, you, and my mom, Pastor Danny. So, there's a couple more, maybe a couple more, a couple more. The, uh, so, but uh, we had a wonderful time, man. I think I ate all the, all the, the, the greasy uh, Latino foods you could eat in like two or three day time frame. I ate tamales, we ate pozole, we ate menudo, we ate buñuelos. We, you know, it was like, man, we were just racking them up. We just kept on going, right? Just eating all these foods and having a ton of fun. My kids are singing songs and playing the piano, and it's, it's uh, Christmas Eve. And uh, one very interesting thing happened is that uh, we just had a ton of gifts this year. You know, um, when typically we don't have a whole lot of gifts. We have something for everyone. But this year we had a ton of gifts because we had relatives from San Diego come by. And so relatives from San Diego, so there's about 20 of us there at the house, and we're eating, and we're singing songs, and uh, having all this really good time. And, and I look over at the Christmas tree, and there's like a mountain of gifts. The best part about it is that we only bought a small section of that mountain of gifts. We didn't buy all of them, because we only bought the ones for our kids and some of our, our, our nephews and nieces. But here was this mountain of gifts. How many know that the gifts cost a lot less for small children? The gifts for grown folk are a lot more expensive. How many know what I'm talking about? So, that, you know, so, but it was really exciting to see this mountain of gifts. And something occurred to me at, at, at this Christmas uh, time celebration that we were having at my house because I really love it. One of the best parts about Christmas is, is knowing that there's a gift under that tree for you, right? And I was really excited that there were gifts under the tree for everyone else. And it occurred to me, something really struck me while I was looking at this and while I was thinking about this. It occurred to me that in the same way that I was in that room and I could say that there was a gift for everyone, there was a gift that had been placed under that tree, very special for everyone, that there, when, I, when I come to church, and I think about what God's doing and who God is and, and the work and the role of the Holy Spirit. It occurred to me that God has provided a gift for every in each and every one of you. It occurred to me that the Bible says the Holy Spirit distributes gifts to the members of the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit distributes gifts. To, to followers of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit distributes gifts. How many know the Holy Spirit is better than Santa Claus? Amen? The Holy Spirit distributes gifts that can change the trajectory of your life. The gift of God really starts, at, really starts at the cross of Jesus. You know, in our church, one of the things I love, we never put the cross before the Christmas tree. We always keep the cross central because we remember what Christ did. Not only that he came, that he was born, but that he also died and that he paid a price and he paid it for us. And he had you and I in mind when he died on that cross. But I want you to open your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Because I want to look today about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the gifts that God has distributed by his Holy Spirit to each and every one of us. Because the Bible says that you already have a gift. God has placed in each and every one of you. When I look across the room and... You know, I know we're a little, we're a little scattered out. But when I look across the room, I see, I see gifts everywhere. 
I see gifts all over. I don't just see people sitting down. I see gifts. I see, I see packages wrapped in, 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 in different colors. And, and, and how many know God loves the red, yellow, black, and white? We are all precious in his sight. Amen. And, and God doesn't just have those gifts that are wrapped and that are made in, 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 in human form, but God also places a spiritual gift inside of each and every one of them. So this is a very powerful, a very dynamic, this is a very explosive sight to see because I believe one day when all those gifts come together and we begin to operate at a whole other level of commitment to the vision and mission that God's given the church, that something amazing is going to take place. I believe there's so much more in store for what God has for us. Look at what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 7. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. The Bible says, you know that when you were pagan, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. And what, what, and what the Apostle Paul is saying is, the Apostle Paul is saying, I want to talk to you about these gifts because there's some misunderstandings and there's some things that need to be clarified and there's some things that, that we need to address and that we need to, we need to not make complicated, but we need to simplify. And so the Apostle Paul uses a word in here, and sometimes it sounds like a derogatory term, but sometimes it sounds like a bad word, like, like, like it, it's something negative. But he uses the word pagans, and I want to just want to clarify something. The Apostle Paul is saying, before Christ, he's talking about before you became a Christian, before you gave your heart to the Lord, before you surrendered to him, before you confessed your sins and acknowledged your need for a Savior, before that, you were living a life where you were putting your faith, your hope, your trust in all these things. Your identity and your peace, your love and your joy was based upon all these external things, all these things from the world, and you were possibly living in a way that was rebelling against God that didn't want to have anything to do with God. And by that, by choosing to live that way, the Apostle Paul is saying, when you were once or at one time or while you were pagans, in other words, while you were distant and far from the Lord and didn't want to have anything to do with God, you put your faith, your hope, and your trust, and you were chasing out of the, after these mute idols, out of these, after these things that couldn't save you, couldn't deliver you, couldn't set you free. So the Apostle Paul is just making a distinction. He's just clarifying some things. But then he's also saying, but now, look at what he says. Let's go on. In verse 3. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. In other words, you can't proclaim Christ and then deny Christ's power. You can't proclaim Jesus and then trash talk Jesus. You can't call upon the name of Jesus and share Jesus and then deny what the Bible says about Jesus. So the Apostle Paul is clarifying. He is rightly dividing the word of God, rightly dividing the word of truth. He's, he's, he's highlighting some things and drawing some distinctions so that we would all be on the same page. And then he says, he says, in fact, it, it, and, and it continues, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So no one can call upon the Lord or say Jesus is Lord except by the power of God. Because when we call upon Jesus as Lord, it produces fruit. It produces spiritual fruit. When we call upon Jesus as Lord, what happens is it produces a fruit that leads to salvation, that leads to a relationship with God. So the Apostle Paul is clarifying and here's one of the things that I've learned, man, just sharing with Jesus, talking to people about Jesus. I bought a, a guy a cup of coffee the other day, and we sat around and talked. And what I realized is everybody wants the blessings of God. What they don't want is Jesus as their Lord and Savior. People want the blessing of God, but, but they, they, they shy away from, they're very hesitant about making Jesus the Lord and Savior, the director, the ruler, the, the, the person that governs over their lives. 
very hesitant about surrendering. And the Apostle Paul says, basically, he's talking to the church. When we talk about spiritual gifts, we're talking to believers. We're talking to Christians. We're talking to men and women who love God. We're talking to people that are committed, people that want to grow. They want to take it to the next level, people that want to do something great for the Lord, just like Pastor Dan Jr. was, was talking about, the year 2016, going where we've never been, doing what we've never done, because God is behind it. That's what the Apostle Paul, he's, he's talking to us. He's talking to us. He's talking to Christians. And he's clarifying some things. So maybe you're not serving the Lord today, man. Maybe you don't know anything about God. Maybe you're just so far from God, all this stuff sounds weird. Well, guess what? I'm going to let you off the hook today. I'm going to cut you some slack. Because the Apostle Paul is saying, believers, men and women of God, I don't want you to be ignorant about the gifts of the Spirit at work in you by God's power. He's talking to the church. And look at what he says in verse 4. In verse 4 he says, there are different kinds of gifts. Or in, in other words, a diversity of gift, a variety of gift. He said, but the same spirit distributes them. In other words, they have their source from God. In verse 5 says, there are different kinds of service or different kinds of ministry or different kinds of outcome and working functions that meet needs. But the same Lord, Jesus, essentially, it's the same Lord governing over, watching over. It's the same ministry of Christ being continued in us. In verse 6, there are different kinds of workings or manifestations, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Regardless of the gift, what kind of gift, or, or, or the outcome of that gift, or the function or the purpose of that gift, it is God at work in each and every time, in each and every one of you. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. And then look what he says. Look, let's talk about some of these gifts in verse 7. He says, now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Now to everybody, something is given that is to be a blessing to the common good. There's a purpose. And verse 8 says, to one is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. So to one a message of wisdom and then to another a message of knowledge. Now it's interesting, man. You know how you know somebody has a gift, a gift of wisdom? You can go to them. You can ask them a question. You can want some help or some feedback. And, and, and when somebody has a gift of wisdom, they don't just see what's happening right now, right now in your life. When you talk to them and you ask for counsel and you ask for guidance, it's always biblically based. But they don't just look at what's happening today. They look down the line as to what's taking place in the future. They don't just see what's going on in the future. They also see what's the breadth and width and depth of what's happening to the left and to the right of you. And they look at the situation from different angles. And their wisdom is full and rich. Guidance and counsel. And it's always biblically based. Spirit of wisdom. You know how you know somebody has a, uh, the gift of knowledge? Uh, because what happens is they always seem to kind of know you and, and, and read your mail and, and have word about you. You know what I mean? There's this understanding. There's an intuition. There's a sensitivity to you that you don't even know about, but that they speak into your life because God reveals it to them. And sometimes you'll go and you'll say, oh, brother, sister, can you pray with me? And they'll say, sure, I'll pray with you. And then all of a sudden, in, 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 in their prayer, and you didn't tell them what the prayer was it was unannounced, right? And so it's a top secret prayer. But all of a sudden, God begins to reveal to them. God begins to, to download into their spirit how to pray for you, how to intercede, how to, how to stand in the gap, what's going on in your life. God begins to speak through them. Information that you didn't share. That gift of knowledge. And then look at what the Bible says. The Bible says there, there are other gifts in verse 9, it says, to another, there's, there's a gift of faith by the same spirit, and to another, the gift of healing by that one spirit. You know, I, I love the gift of faith. Unfortunately, the gift of faith sometimes comes about as a result of very difficult circumstances. 
You know, the gift of faith often is at work in people who have suffered. The gift of faith often is at work in people who've had like a near-death experience. The gift of faith is often at work of people who've hit rock bottom, who know what it's like to be six feet under and still alive. The gift of faith is often at work through people who've been to, uh, through, through the worst of times and experiences of life and have seen God basically resurrect them, put them back on their feet, and give them a hope for tomorrow all over again. The gift of faith is often found in people who believe the impossible because they've been through it. Come on, somebody say amen. And then it talks about the gift of miracles. And, and you know, man, uh, uh, you know, God, how many know God's a miracle worker, amen? Sometimes, you can give the Lord a hand clap, man. God's a miracle worker. We're, we're sitting in a miracle. We're standing in a miracle. We, we, we are miracles. Sometimes we're, we're miracles in process and, and others of us have come to the stage of, of just experiencing the miraculous uh, transformation of God's power and at work in our lives. But the miraculous really does come. And I believe uh, many times we have not because we ask not. And sometimes if we would just cry out to God and be and, and just be determined like the widow who lost the, who lost a coin in her house. She cleaned that whole thing. She, she didn't leave anything undone. She swept the floor. Uh, she, uh, she looked through every nook and cranny and every cr crack until she found it. The miraculous happens. You know, one of the greatest miracles I've ever seen is the miracle of, of conversion, of transformation. The miracle of salvation. But God is not limited to the miracle of salvation. God is a miracle working God. The Bible says there are different, there are different gifts. And to another, the miraculous powers. To another, the, the gift of prophecy. And to another, the distinguishing between spirits. And to another, the speaking in tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. You know, when we talk about the gift of healing... You know, I love what God's doing in our congregation. There are testimony after testimony of God's healing power and of God's healing presence. There are testimony of testimony about people going through surgery and God at work in their lives. And, and more and more of those testimonies are finding their way back. We're excited about what the Lord is doing. And, and uh, one of the things, uh, one of the testimonies of my mom and uh, my family, my mom's here. God's healed her. Uh, uh, I, I remember uh, she was in her late 30s and the, and the enemy uh, had, had struck her with a disease. And I believe the doctor told her she'd only live 5, 10 years. I think she's almost 70 or she's 61, 68, 69. I just told her age, praise the Lord. She's 70 and, and we were supposed to have 10, 10 years with her and she's still alive. Come on, somebody say amen. And she's a walking miracle of God's healing power and presence. The Bible talks about the prophetic word, the miracle of prophecy. The prophetic word that when a vision comes and that, that word is from the Lord, how that word can change and transform, how that word can break through the chains that bind us and set people free. These gifts of the Spirit, and then it ends in verse 11, and it says, and, and all these gifts are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each of us. How many know God didn't leave any of us, any of us out, Amen. What to do with the gifts that God has given us? What to do with these spiritual gifts? What do we do with these spiritual gifts? We all have one. God has all gifted us. God has, all, God has blessed all of us. God, is, God has ministered to us. God has deposited something in our spirit. What do we do with them? Number one, here's what we do. Number one, we unpack the gift. Number one, we have to unpack the gift. We have to open that gift up in the name of Jesus and see what is in there, see what God's doing, see what God has deposited. We have to acknowledge, we have to recognize that the Holy Spirit has given us spiritual gifts. We have to unpack it. How do you know what's in the gift unless you unwrap it? Boy, let my kids help you out, man. They start to open up other people's gifts, didn't even belong to them. But isn't it like that sometimes somebody has to come alongside of you and show you the way? 
Isn't it like that sometimes? You're gifted. You're blessed. God has poured out his love into your heart. The Holy Spirit has done all these wonderful things. And then you're still trying to figure it out. You're still trying to, to work it out. And somebody has to come alongside of you many times and begin to speak into your life and direct you in your journey of spiritual faith in order to unpack that gift. But it's still something you got to do. Number two, what do you do with the gifts that God's given you? What do you do? Number two, you dedicate those gifts to the purposes of God. Number two, you dedicate your gifts to the purposes of God. The gifts of God are to serve the purposes of God. Did you know that when the Holy Spirit gave you the gift, it wasn't just something for you to enjoy, but it was meant to be a blessing to you and to everyone around you. That's what verse 7 is about. Verse 7, it says that the Holy Spirit poured out these gifts for the common good. The gifts have been poured out in your life, not just for your good, but for other people's good. Not just for your good, but for the common good. Not just for your good, but so that you could do some good in your hood. Come on, somebody. I know you live in a gated community, but you got a hood there too. God is calling you to do some good in your hood. Sometimes your good is your hood is, is not just the, the community you live in. Sometimes your hood is your high school or your junior high school. Sometimes your hood is your workplace. Sometimes your hood is your family. Sometimes your hood is that, is, that, is that place where you shop and that place where you hang out and that park where you kick back. So God has given you these gifts. God has distributed these gifts. They distributed the gifts to you so that you could do some good in your hood. And that's what the Bible means by the common good. The common good. So that you could do a whole lot of good in your hood. Number three, what do you do with the gifts that God's given you? What do you do with all those gifts that you've received? You unpack them. You dedicate them to the Lord. And then number three, you glorify God by putting those gifts into action. You glorify God by putting the gifts into action. You see, something powerful takes place when you begin to, to walk in the gift and the anointing, when you begin to walk in the grace and favor of the Lord, when you begin to walk in the spiritual power, the spiritual gifting God has placed in your life. You know what happens? You begin to glorify the Lord. You begin to exalt the name of Jesus. You begin to magnify the name of the Lord. You begin to make God's name known. You begin to make God's name great wherever you are and wherever you are working, wherever you are putting to work the gift that God gave you, wherever that may be. You glorify God. You know, man, I know what it's like to, to glorify the Lord and and be in some real difficult circumstances, but know that God had blessed me, God had given me something, that there was something that I was supposed to do that nobody else could do for me. And, 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 and it started at a very young age, something I learned from my mom and it's in our upbringing, growing up in the neighborhood, growing up in the body and, and the government housing, the projects, things of that nature. My mom was serving the Lord, preaching, praying, prophesying, and laying hands on folks, and, 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 and seeing God do all these things, and yet we lived in a very difficult circumstances. But I I believe it was because she put the spiritual gifting that work in her life to use to work it honored and glorified God it magnified the name of the Lord and you want to know what what happens when you begin to magnify the name of the Lord you begin to attract the blessings of God to your life somebody say amen you begin to attract the blessings of God to your home, to your family, to your marriage because you are glorifying, you're magnifying, you're, you're exalting the name of Jesus Christ by putting to use what God gave you. By putting to use the spiritual gift that God deposited in your life. One of the things I love about our mission, one of the things I love about our motto here at uh, TC ministering to the needs of the people. You know, one of the things I love about that is, is because there is a key that will unlock the, the door to the spiritual passion in your life. Here's what it is. When you see a need, when you recognize that something needs to get done, it's really because God is showing it to you. God is talking to you. God is dealing with you. God is, God is, God is 
grabbing a hold of you, trying to get you to do something about it. And you know what happens when you do something about it? When you do something about the need that you see, whether it's in the church or in the lives of others, wherever it may be, you will begin to activate and put into action the spiritual gifts that God has deposited in your, in your life. And when you do, you will magnify and exalt the Lord and you will be putting your gifts to use in the way that will benefit the lives of others. Can somebody say amen? Ministering to the needs of the people. That's what we've been doing at a ch as a church going on 80 years now. And you know, we have a wonderful 80, 80th anniversary cele celebration planned in the month of July. And it's going to be a very exciting time of ministering to the needs of the people. Something that we have been, the church has been about and the church has been doing for many years. Number four, you use your spiritual gifts. You, you, when you use your spiritual gifts, you use your spiritual gifts to produce fruit in the lives of others. And you know the kind of fruit that I'm talking about is spiritual fruit. Use your spiritual gifts, and when you do, you will produce spiritual fruit in the lives of others. But not only that, that spiritual fruit won't just be produced in the lives of others. It will also be produced in your life because God will have to pour through you in order to minister and pour into the lives of others. And you know what happens when you use your spiritual gifts? When you use your spiritual gifts, it always develops Christ-like character in the lives of others. Spiritual gifts also develop Christ-like character in the lives of others. You know, I'm asked sometimes, what's the difference between a talent and a spiritual gift? And that's a really good question. And the truth of the matter is, God created you with your talents, and the Holy Spirit deposits these spiritual gifts in you, so they both have, have, have something very important to do with your divine design, but there is a difference. Because our talents have a natural foundation, our spiritual gifts have a, have a supernatural foundation. Our talents are a part of the creative state, but our spiritual gifts are part of our new creation in Christ. Our talents do a lot of good anywhere and everywhere we apply them, but our spiritual gifts set people free and lead people to heaven. Come on, somebody, say amen. You can give the Lord a hand clap, that's all right. And yet, God creates all of you with this divine design. God creates all of you with the divine design. God creates you with these talents, and God deposits in you these spiritual gifts, and God gives you these wonderful abilities because God is desiring to use them to fulfill God's purpose and God's plan. In other words, God's got something in store. God's got something that he wants us all to do with what God has given us. Number five, and then I got a really cool story I want to share with you really quick. Let God determine what you do with the gifts God has given you. Let God determine what you do with the gifts God has given you. When you do that, you realize that the gifts from God belong to God and because they come from God, God actually gets to determine what you do with them, where you use them, according to his plans and purposes. God is the author of those spiritual gifts, and God gives them to you to work in you God's purposes and God's plan. You know, there's something really powerful in a story that uh, I, I want to share with you, and it comes from just realizing that there is a very awesome anointing on this church. There's a very strong anointing on this church. And I'm going I'm to drop down here and mess up the camera and the lighting and everything. But here's what I want to say. I just want to get a little bit closer. There's a very powerful anointing on Templo Calvario Church. And when you begin to use the gifts that God has given you, God begins to move in your life and take you to a whole nother level of experiencing his power and his presence. When you begin to use the gifts God has given you, God begins to raise you up. You begin to participate in the anointing that is at work in this church. You know when that we were building the we were doing the construction project in building number two, Pastor Danny DeLeon Jr. shared a story with us 
we had all these challenges, all these, all these obstacles, all these hurdles, all these things that had to be approved, and all, all, these, all these rules and regulations and all these statutes and, and working with the city and working with the county and working with the state. And the construction, the supervisor, the superintendent of the construction project, he's one of the pastors of a daughter church. His name is Pastor Carl Gutierrez. He said something really powerful to Pastor Dan Jr. Pastor Dan Jr. is the overseer and the, the point leader on that whole project, worked directly with Pastor Carl Gutierrez, and together I believe God used them to bring about a miracle in, in our facilities, in our predicament. And Pastor Carl turned around to Pastor Danny Jr. and he said this. He says, Did you, you, know, you know what? He says, Templo Calvario, TC, is walking in the divine favor of the Lord. He said, this church is walking in divine favor before the Lord. Divine favor. You know what that means? When, 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 when TC is in divine favor before the Lord, that means something about everybody in this room, in, whether you like it or not. It means something about all of us. You know what it means? It means that all of us are walking in divine favor before the Lord. Because we're a part of this church. Come on, somebody. Say amen. Give him a hand clap. That means your marriage has access to divine favor before the Lord. Come on, somebody. Say amen. That means your children have access to a divine favor before the Lord. That means your business. Come on, somebody has access to divine favor before the Lord. Because if divine favor is over this church, it is like an umbrella of God's blessings that the enemy has to struggle against to, to, to destroy. But because God's divine favor is over this church, that verse in the Bible that says, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the, word, than the world is true. And it's true about me and it's true about you and it's true about Templo Calvary. Greater is he that is at work in TC. Come on, somebody. Than all the powers of darkness trying to stop the work of God here. You know why? You know, I believe the divine favor of the Lord is over this church because God has a big vision for this church. I believe God has a big vision for this church. I, I believe in many ways we can't see, we don't understand. I think if God would show it to us, we'd get scared. <laughs> I think if God would reveal it to us all at once, we, you know, it, it may freak us out. I think the vision of God is so big for this church. And I think because that vision is so big, that divine favor is over this church. And that divine favor is like an atmospheric experience. It's like a, a, a change in the atmosphere over T.C. And I think this last, this year, I think this last experience that we had, I think there was a change in the atmosphere over TC. I think God did something in the heavenlies over our church. I think there was a breakthrough in that change in the atmosphere, I believe, is not contained by these four walls, but is meant to go into our homes. I believe there's supposed to be a change in the atmosphere in the places where we reside. Come on, somebody say amen. I believe there's supposed to be a change in the atmosphere in our marriage, in our relationship to our children. Come on, somebody say amen. I believe there's supposed to be a change in the atmosphere in our schools, in our vocation, in our places of employment, in the places where we hang out and where we spend our time. And I believe that we participate in that atmosphere, that heavenly atmosphere. Because of the divine favor of the Lord on this church, because of the vision that God has for TC. That's what I believe. And I believe when you serve God, I believe when you activate your gifts, I believe when you dedicate your gifts to the Lord, I believe when you open up your gifts, I believe when you use your gifts to glorify the Lord, you are participating in the divine favor of the Lord. And I believe as you participate, you begin to walk in the divine favor of the Lord. I be believe that the blessings of God become attracted to you and will find you out.
in ways that you were not aware that God was at work until it happens. Divine favor of the Lord. Divine favor of the Lord over TC, over you, over me. Isn't that something? Come on, give the Lord a hand clap. Sometimes you just got to jump off the pulpit. I think next time I'm just going to get a trampoline, put it down there in Jesus' name. You know what's so important about that? This vision that God has for this church is so important because of this. Because you become the vision that you embrace. This is bad to the bone pastor in San Diego. His name is Sergio de la Mora. That brother's cool, smooth. Planted a church. Wife, five, six kids. Moved to San Diego. Did something crazy like that. Left everything he knew, went to where God told him to, to go. And, and something that God showed him very early on, it, it was this principle that you become the vision that you embrace. And you know, I thought about that, and, and here's what I want to say about that. You know why? The, the, the vision is so important because you really do become whatever vision you embrace. Whatever vision you have for yourself, you're going to become. Whatever vision you have for your family, for your marriage, you're going to become. Whatever vision you have for your babies, for your kids, for your mijos and mijas, they're going to become. Whatever vision you have for your business and, 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 and your education and your future and your gonna career, that's what will be realized. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. So it's really a principle of life, but it's also a principle of the Spirit. It's a principle of life, but it's also a principle of the Spirit. So whatever vision you embrace, you will become. Here's what's so important by that. Because Proverbs chapter 29 says, My people perish because of the lack of vision. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But here's what I want to say to you. They don't just perish where there's no vision. They perish where there's the wrong vision. Come on, somebody. You also perish when you're following after the wrong vision. Your marriage perishes when you're following after the wrong vision. Your children perish. Your education, your finances, your investment, your future perishes when you're following after the wrong vision. So the problem is not just no vision. The problem can also be the wrong vision. Jesus came and he said, I got a vision for your life. Jesus came and, and he told young people, young people, I got a vision for your life. Jesus came and he told old people, old people, I've got a vision for your life. Jesus came and he told married people, married people, I got a vision for your life. Jesus came and he told single people, single people, I got a vision for your life. You know what it was? It's in John 10, 10. He said, I came so the young, the old, the married, the single, the, 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 the not so old, and, and the getting older, and all of them could live life and live it abundantly while they were here on earth. Come on, somebody, say amen. That's what it says. John 10, 10, Jesus said, I've got a vision for you, and it is a vision of abundant life. But then there's the other part of that verse, but there's an old devil, there's an enemy, there's a liar and a trickster and a prankster. He's really good at it, and he's been at it for, since the beginning of time, and he hasn't changed. And the Bible says that he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You know, and one of the things, man, if the devil can't get you to stop serving Jesus, he'll get you to do things uh, to, 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 to make, put God on, your, on the last list of your priority, to put, put serving the Lord on the lowest uh, priority, to put your commitment to Christ uh, on the back burner or in the, in the garage and, and forget about it and leave it there. So sometimes the devil doesn't succeed in stopping you. Sometimes he just succeeds in distracting you. From the vision. From the vision that God has for you. From the vision that God has for you. 
Why? Because you will become the vision that you embrace. Because you will become the vision you embrace. Sometimes the problem isn't no vision or lack of vision. Sometimes the problem is the wrong vision. I want to tell you a story. There was a couple of ministers that got together in 1914. 1914, 300 ministers got together. 300 ministers got together and they made a resolution. There was a motion. It was a minister's meeting. There was only 300 of them. But these crazy 300 ministers entered into a covenant and they made a pact. They made a pact not just with God but with each other. They made a promise not just to the Lord but to one another. They made a pledge not just to heaven but to earth. And here's what they did. They said, these 300 people, they said, as long as we're here, as long as we're alive, as long as we have breath, as long as we have finances, as long as, as, long as we can stand, walk, talk, move, get around, here's what we're going to do. They pledged to carry out the greatest work of evangelism that the world had ever seen. What? 300. 300 people pledged to carry out the greatest work of evangelism that had ever been seen in 1914. 100 years later. 100 years later. And you know what? That little Pentecostal group of 300 crazy people. 300 crazy people in 1914. Today, along with many other ministries and organizations, there are over 600 million charismatic Pentecostals in the world today. Come on, somebody say amen. They all participated. They were all a part of this. They all went after it. They united in one spirit, in one accord. They gathered their gifts. Come on, somebody. They united their gifts. They united their gifting, their talents, their abilities, their divine design. And they committed to a common vision for the greater good of heaven and earth. And 100 years later, we're a part of that, the fruit of that commitment, of that pledge. But here's what I, here's the question I ask myself. What would happen at TC? What would happen if we entered into a crazy agreement like that, what would happen if we entered into a pact? What would take place? What would we look like? What would our church look like? What would, what would, what would our prayer life look like? What would our devotionals look like? What would, that, what would that 21 days of prayer and fasting look like? What would the week of prayer look like? What would evangelism, what would sharing our faith look like? My children remind me every day that sharing is caring. Come on, somebody. And they're right. Sharing is caring. What would doing missions at TC look like? What would, what would not just funding missions, but going on missions and leading missions do like? Look like. What kind of church would we be if we committed, if we entered into a covenant, if we entered into a pact, here's what's so important about your gifts. When you unpack those gifts and you dedicate them to the Lord and you, and you glorify God by putting them to action, when you allow God to determine what you do with them, Here's what happens. You become the vision that you embrace. You become who God intended you to be. You begin to do and to fulfill the plan and the purposes of God for your life. At the 
TC, here's what, here's what I want you to get. Go ahead and stand to your feet with me. Here at Templo Calvario, I think the good Lord is calling us to do a couple of things. I think God is moving in this church in a mighty and a powerful way. I think, number one, God is calling us to, to, to turn people's hearts to Jesus. I think God, that's what, that's what the Christmas production was about. That's what the Sunday morning event was about. That's what the outreach and evangelism, that's what the gifts were about. They were about turning the hearts of young people to Jesus. Not just young people, but families to Jesus. You want to know why that's so important? Did you know that the majority of Americans living in the U.S. today are below the age of 20? I said the majority of Americans living in the nation today are below the age of 20. So this vision about turning, turning people's hearts to Jesus has everything to do with turning the hearts of the next generation to Christ so that they will serve God, so that they will do something great for God. And you know what? It doesn't matter how old you are. I think this is something for everyone. Here's why. Because whether you're, you're old or getting older or, 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 or the oldest, it doesn't matter. We all have spiritual children. We all have spiritual families. And as parents, we get excited when we see our kids serving God. We get excited when we see our, our mijos and our mijas living for the Lord. We get fired up when we see them walking in divine favor. That's what's so important about turning the hearts of youth and families to Jesus. But you know, there's, there's more. Secondly, here's what I think. It's not just turning their hearts to Jesus, but it's also teaching them to apply the Word of God to their lives. You know, when you teach somebody to apply the Word of, word of God to their lives, you know you're just really sharing your life with them. You're just really speaking out of lessons learned. You're just really speaking out of life lived. And I would love to see the day that when men and women of God, Christians married and single alike, are mentoring, are encouraging young Timothys in their lives. And, and that young Timothy doesn't have to be a young kid. It could be an old kid, but that's a new Christian that needs somebody to speak into their life and show them the way. That's why I love Champion of Faith. Come on, somebody, give, give it a hand clap, Champion of Faith. You know, Champion of Faith, I think that process, that grow process, that growth process, one of the most important things we have going in our church. It's not just a, a membership process. It's a discipleship process. And it's about helping people grow in their walk with God. It's about growing them up teaching them to apply the Word of God to their lives. Number three, here's the other thing I think we should commit to. I think we should commit to training followers to serve God, not just in the church, but also in the world. I think, I think that the, the skill sets, the leadership lessons, the, 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 the vision they receive, the, the training they get here should be something that is transferable so that they're not just doing something great for God inside the church, but they're also transforming and changing the world around them. Come on, somebody say amen. I think we should also be committed to training people to serve God here in the church and in the world. Here's the fourth thing. I think we should commit to taking the hope and the plan of salvation in Jesus Christ around the world. Wouldn't that be a trip? Wouldn't it be amazing if we as a church at TC led missions trips and did missions to all the continents of the earth? Come on, somebody say amen. Wouldn't it be amazing? Can you imagine what God would have to do in us in order to pour through us to fulfill that vision? Wouldn't that be awesome? Here's what would happen. Not only would the world change, but we would change because we would become the vision that we are embracing. And that's my prayer. Come on, somebody say amen. Give the Lord a hand clap.
Now just grab somebody's hand. Uh, let, let's let's uh, stretch across the aisle. Grab somebody's hand to the left and to your right. Let's just pray as a church right now. Just enter into covenant agreement. Let me ask uh, Pastor Dan Jr. to come up here with me. You know, we have a, a pastoral team. We meet with Pastor Dan Sr. every week. Pastor Dan Sr. is our team leader, and we're on a ministry team together as, as ministers with Pastor Marcos Roman. One of the things I love about training people to serve God in the church and world is because the way we intend to do that is through ministry teams. I'm believing God will give us a church where every member is on a team. It just depends on what team. Not only will we have ministry teams, but we'll have team leaders for all those teams. And wouldn't it be awesome if God would make us a church of 300 that entered into covenant to, trans, trans, uh, to turn hearts to Christ, to teach people to apply the word of God to their lives, to train people to serve God in the, in the church and world, and to take the gospel message of hope and the plan of salvation in Christ to the ends of the earth. Wouldn't that be amazing if we had 300 people covenant to do that? Wouldn't that be awesome? So I'm going to ask Dan Jr., let's, let's just come over here and let's just stand together. And I want to, I'll open in prayer and then Pastor Dan Jr., you can close in prayer. Father, we just pray today like we're standing in one spirit and one accord, holding the hand of our brother and our sister. And God, we're saying that you would unite our heart. We're asking you to unite our hearts. Put us in one spirit and one accord, God. Let us, let us take, Father God, your vision, God, the vision, Father God, of abundant life. Not just for our lives, but for the lives of others. Let us take that vision of turning hearts that you would use us to turn the hearts of youth and families to Jesus, that you would use us to teach people how to apply the Word of God to their lives, that you would use us to train followers to serve God here in the church but outside in the world as well, and that, God, that every one of us would be marked. Every one of us would be marked by missions. Every one of us would be marked with the heart for the world, with the heart for the world that you created, the lost and the hurting and the needy. And that, God, you would mobilize us as a church to take this gospel message of hope and plan of salvation around the world and to the ends of the earth. And we pray for that today, Lord. Father, this morning it is evident and it is real that the gift of the prophetic has been in action this morning. And Father, we embrace the word that you put on Pastor Tommy this morning to this church, to this congregation, at this moment, Father, that we will embrace your call and not let it fall flat this morning, but take it and run with that commission that we have been given, that the future is coming and it is now, and that the opportunity is for each and every one of us to embrace it and to move forward with it, Father. So as you have spoken to us this morning, my Lord, I cry out and I say, Father, mobilize us in your Son's holy name. You've given us a message. You've given us hope. You've shown us the way, Father. Now may we move in that. And as I hold the hand of my brother, as I hold the hand of my sister this morning, I know I do this not alone. But I do this as a team member. I do this as a family member. I do this as a child of the King and the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Father, let us move in hope. Let us move in truth. Let us see your miraculous everything happen in our lives and in our midst, Father. Thank you for speaking us today. We move and we accept it now. In the name of the Father, the Son. In the Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Give somebody a, a handshake, a high five, a hug, a head shake. Do something. And let's, let's, let's leave today and walk in the divine favor of the Lord. Amen.